showing you streams. This is where I'm at right now. I'm, I'm, 10, 000, I'm at 10,000 feet altitude in the mountains of Breckenridge, Colorado. Um, it's uh, very altitude-y here. You have to drink a lot of water with electrolytes or else you can get altitude sickness, which really sucks. Um, so that sucks. And I just want to know, this is very important. Can you feel, can you guys hear the wind? It's very windy up here. And if it's windy, um, maybe I'll try and take it inside. I just want to know if it's really windy. I apologize for the quality of this broadcast. What's going on, Rue? How are you? Uh, I just want to apologize for the quality of the broadcast. And I'm just sort of dealing with um, the elements and whatnot. So here, I'm going to set this up. Uh, set this up so I can talk. Got Diet Coke. Thank you, Rich. Not very windy. Thank you. Great. Great, great, great. All right. Thanks, Mike. Okay. This episode is ah sponsored by my brother's Diet Coke. My brother lives up here in Brackenridge, and I've been coming here since I was since I could walk. Uh, we're, we're a family of skiers, and so yeah, we we come up here. I honestly didn't think I was going to get back up here for a few years, especially with what happened with uh, Corona. Hey, what's going on, Russell? Thanks for letting me know. Uh, great guys, great, good. I got a nice episode for us today, um, which I'm going to explain in a minute. So why am I in Breckenridge, Colorado? So my my dad, who is like I said, we've been coming here forever, and um, my dad is pushing seventy. He wanted to do a road trip, and yeah, <laughs> that's right, Ravi. They they don't have there's no seltzer up in these mountains. Just my brother's diet cokes. What's going on, Umberto? How are you? Mr. Jim, how are you? Well, we got a we got a nice audience today. This is great. If you're gonna ski, you ski with me. Down to these mountains never last. When these I don't know I don't know where I'm going with that. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with that. Uh no. Uh my yeah, I just um I just hopped in I hopped in the car because uh oh shit. Fucking thing. My god. This is gonna be annoying, guys. I'm just bear with me. Um, so yeah, my set, my pop is pushing 70. Uh, he wanted to do the 2000 mile drive because of flying. Doesn't want to fly during COVID understandably. So, uh, was going to drive alone. Uh, I, since I don't have a job, I was like, fuck, I'll, I'll jump in the car with you. Um, wife, well, got the okay from the wife boss who, uh, who's minding the kids and, uh, I'm here for a week. And, uh, I figured I would bring some reading material with me along the way. And uh, I bought, recently, I bought this with me. Barnes & Noble. Oh, scream with me. If you're going to ski. Oh, my God. That's the new, ep This the name of this episode is actually, if you're going to ski, ski with me. Thanks, Russell. Because that just makes so much more sense, being where we are up here in the hills. Um, so, again, if it gets windy, let me know. Uh, we're gonna try and we're gonna try and go for some time while I'm charging my phone so it doesn't die, and uh, yeah. So we hopped in a car. We drove 2,000 miles in 28 hours. We just kept switching off, switching off, doing you know 300 miles here, 300 miles there. Uh, we pulled over to just uh, go to sleep for a little bit. Came back, boom. Now we're here, and um, I was gonna make this. I might make this a two-part episode uh, or a one-part episode. Um, Thanks, Rue. It's not actually his birthday yet, but he's just he's pushing 70. He's getting up there in years and just... I didn't want him to drive 2,000 miles by himself. He needed somebody uh, to be there with him. Uh, so I'm glad that I could be useful even as an unemployed fool. Um, the only thing that sucks is the su The weather here is so fucked, man. I swear to God. The clouds... The, 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 the sun keeps hitting me in the face. I'm going to have to flip the camera over so we look at this book. All right, a little preface here about what we're doing. So, uh, so there have been, there's a whole history of, hey, what's going on? Oh, hi. I got a dog out here with me. Um, all right, I guess he's not bothering anybody. 
that wind is too crazy. So crazy. Um, so, so there have been many attempts to do uh, books uh, about the misfits. And, um, well, this there's a long history of, of misfits and books. Misfits and books. Uh, and I, I think it really goes back 30 years ago, uh, roughly. Something like that. Wow, yeah. I would say about, about 30 years ago, um, there was uh, a guy that you guys all know. His name was Mark Kennedy. He started to compile information uh, for a book. It was called The Misfits Book. Um, he met up with some fans. They started comparing information. This is when all... All the information, all this information is being compiled about the misfits. And he's, his dream is that someday he's going to turn it into, it's either going to be, it's going to be called just the misfits book. That's the, that's the name of the game. That's, that's the plan. Um, and he gets so far in his research and, you know, and again, I might, I might, I might be kind of like patchy with the story here. Um, so I might not have all my, my facts, my ducks in a row. He, um, he, uh, he got to a place where he eventually interviewed Glenn Danzig, right? He, he, around 1999, 2000, I think I've talked about this before. Uh, there, he came incredibly close to, to putting together this book. Uh, he had some, uh, co-authors that were, uh, involved with this book. Uh, and it was, it was going to be basically like the definitive, uh, thing or was, might've been an, a definitive tomb, uh, on the misfits. And, uh, it never, it, it did not happen. Uh, it did not. It, it, it got the kibosh from Glenn. Um, you know, I think that's part of the problem when you try to work with these guys, the misfits themselves. No disrespect to you guys. Love you guys, the misfits. But, um, you know, they are... This is a band that, whether it be Glenn or Jerry or whoever, has uh, battled and struggled and spent lots of money trying to control, retain their image. Um, starting back... Starting back, really, if you really want to get technical, starting back all the way to 1978, if you think about it, think about it, Glenn, Glenn, you know, uh, wants to put out his records under something called Blank Records, and he finds out a major label, Mercury Records, is using Blank and has to, gets into a whole thing with them, and uh, they, they work out a deal, and, and Glenn starts Plan 9 and gets... Um, Gets uh, what you call it, uh, and th and they get to keep blank records for Per Ubu, per Perry Ubu, however you pronounce that. Um, and then the next thing that happens with that, really, um, if you're going by, you know, I've been doing a lot of listening to the interviews and stuff. Glenn took uh, Glenn. I guess the, the 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 change in the font happened when Glenn saw that Minor Threat had ha a very similar sort of font, or at least in his mind, in his perception. You may disagree. To be honest, I don't think it was really that similar. But Glenn looked at the Minor Threat logo and was like, this is too close to the Misfits logo. And that's when they made the switch to the famous Monsters of Film Man, Filmland. You know? uh, and then moving on from there, you have the, 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 the great Civil War, the, the great you know lawsuit battles of the 80s and 90s between Glenn and Jerry over you know, the domination of who's going to get the, the name or who's going to uh, be able to do what. You know, uh, Jerry and Doyle want to go out and uh, record and perform as the Misfits. Uh, Glenn doesn't want Glenn doesn't want that. And, you know, it's funny. If you really bring it all the way back there, again, not here to talk about Michael Graves, but I'm just saying, if if Glenn had gotten his way, then Michael Graves never would have been involved with the Misfits and never would have had a situation where people are starting to, like, Photoshop the Crimson Ghost as a KKK with a KKK cap on. You know what I'm saying? It's like, brand, talk about brand confusion. And, I mean, that's what essentially, that's what essentially would c sort of curse or plague the Misfits forevermore. Once Jerry did his own version of the Misfits, you have... You have brand confusion. People are not sure what is what. You know what? Uh, uh, oh, American Psycho. Wait, that has a different singer than you know Earth AD. Wait, what? Why is this? Been? You know, it's just a lot of brand confusion. Uh, and you know, fast forward to and then you know, of course, uh, utilizing the power of of their trademarks. You know, like the Crimson Ghost. You know, forget about who owns it or what. What you know where. Uh, who legally, who's, who's legally has the power over that thing that talk about a, a, like this incredible moneymaker, right? You know, you have this like symbol that just, I mean, it's just, 
again, I keep using the word brand. It's probably going to come up a lot here, but it's just like the, the brand power of the Crimson Ghost. It's insane. It's absolutely insane. Um, I think Jerry probably has made way more money with the Crimson Ghost than he ever made with, you know, money guarantees from those live shows with the Misfits. I mean, that is the bread and butter. And of course, what do you do? You have to protect your bread and butter, you know, uh, going after anything that might dilute your brand in any way, shape or form. And, you know, there have been situations where, you know, their uh, former members are trying to do their own thing and, and they get muscled out. You know, um, Bobby Steele got into a, a whole thing uh, over the years with uh, both Glenn and Jerry. Again, I'm not going to go deep into the into those lawsuit situations there. They are so incredibly tangled and muddled and, and crazy. And um, yeah, I don't know, man. It's just there's just there, 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 there's a lot there. I'm not going to dissect all that. That's too. That's a whole separate road that maybe someday we will tackle the uh, the lawsuit from the 80s and 90s. That's going to require a lot of uh, legal document reading. But the point my point is the thesis that I'm trying to purport here and which is going to lead us into what we're going to be looking at is um, anytime somebody tries to do something. Uh, uh, about the misfits, without the misfits' involvement, and without the misfits, okay, um, they they go they they do not take lightly to that. They go they go after people, man, uh, and it's really unfortunate because there's some really cool stuff out there uh, that has never seen the light of day, and there's uh, a lot of cool stuff out there that may never get to see the light of day. Case in point. So as I've said in the past, you've heard me talk in the past about how I'd been doing this for 10 years. And you're like, well, wow, oh, what? You've been doing this for 10 years? It's like, what, what, why, why are you coming about, you know, what, all of a sudden coming out of the woodwork now? And the reason why is because I figured that I should just do my work quietly and not try and draw attention to myself. And I spent years doing that just a long long time i never created a facebook page i never went on facebook i never went on twitter i never went on myspace none of that stuff i just i just contacted people and conducted as many interviews as i can what's going on pat how are you uh how you doing uh say hello to your brother for me and your father um i promise you that stuff is going to come back up uh, and yeah, and I, the, the whole point, God, the sun, man, it's so fucking bright. It was, see, I should have put a, uh, put the umbrella up. This is just, this is crazy. All right. I'm going to, we're not, we're not doing the book just yet. So I'm going to step away into the shade. Cause this is just like bothering the fuck out of me. Fucking hell. All right. That's better. Um, Hey Jason, what's going on? How you doing? Um, so yeah, I spent years. I spent years, uh, uh, just sort of just keeping it really like, um, on the DL, and then when when the Misfits came back together in 2016, that's when I finally was like, "Fuck it, I'm creating a Facebook page. I'm going to start and try and get more public with what it is that I am trying to do." The point is, the theme here is, in general, that if you're trying to do something about the Misfits, it's best to just stay low because you may get uh, unwanted attention from the Misfits, uh, no matter what your intentions are. And I believe that, you know, not, maybe not for, not with everything. Oh, another great example that I, that I neglected to mention all the bootlegging, the tons and tons of bootlegging, those dudes dealt with so much fucking bootlegging, especially, you know, uh, Glenn hates, hates bootleggers and, you know, uh, would break bootleg records that people would bring to him to sign. I don't know how he would even be able to tell what's bootleg and what is not. Although he it, he is very hands-on when it comes to the manufacturing process. So, I don't know. Uh, point is, is that like, there? and there's some things where, you know, Jason says he's got a Misfit, misfit tribute on Spotify. They're like, you know, people covering Misfit songs. The Misfits don't seem to have a problem with that. Um, you know, there's just like certain things that like, they really, really take umbrage with. Uh, so anyway, so Mark Kennedy tried to get this book off the ground. Um, the kibosh came down. I'm not going to get into the details of why or how or who or what, but he got this interview with Glenn Danzig. That's where, you know, everybody knows about Diane D. Piazza and Jimmy Battle and all that stuff. That all came from that interview, right, uh, that, that he had conducted with Glenn. That found out all this additional stuff. Glenn remembers all of it. He, he knows. He knows all that shit. He may, he may not really give a shit about the past uh, the way that we give a shit about his past, but he knows about the fucking past, you know? He knows. He remembers stuff. He remembers a lot of stuff. Um, 
Uh, in any case, so the Misfits book does not get off the ground. There's several other things that try that almost uh, came about. There was a documentary that was being made about Danzig called Danzig Legacy or Danzig Legacy of Brutality, and uh, there was a documentary filmmaker who was working in tandem with Glenn, and. Um, there were some disagreements, and again, Glenn Danzig is a man that likes to be in control of shit. Going back to the bootleg thing, I know I'm jumping all over the place. You know, it, people are bootlegging his records. It's like he just wants to be in control of his thing. That's why he did all the DIY shit that he did. It was it's all in an effort to be in control. Um, you can you can get you know you can say that you could say a lot of things. You could say a lot of negative things. You could blame it on greed. You could blame it on uh, you know just being like like paranoid. Um, but I ultimately think that when, it, when you really boil it down, it's just about being an artist, man. And that dude, Glenn Danzig, he's a true artist. And for that matter, Jerry is a true artist. And those guys, I mean, and, and as I've been doing with my research, you know, doing uh, 1979, um, the, 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 the big special that's going to be coming out, you know, I'm looking over these interviews and it's just like these dudes were just like, we're just going to do this stuff ourselves. They self empower themselves. So when somebody else comes along and like toils with the thing that they that they, you know, put all their blood, sweat and tears with, they get it seems like they just get super irrational about it in every sense of the way. Forget about the fact that, you know, people people by 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 creating content around their band all they're doing is just building it they're making it more valuable you're making the brand more valuable more people want to you know the more misfits related projects there are out there uh the bigger it's going to be not not the smaller you know those guys are all about supply and demand i mean look at the misfit shows you know what i mean it's like they're literally doing they're literally doing what they uh, were doing back in the day. The Misfits are still operating the way they did in the year 1980 to 1982, right? Just playing like one show per year. That's literally what they're doing. Except now they're playing one show a year for $1.5 million and selling I don't even know how much in merch. You know what I mean? Uh, and you know what's kind of funny though about those guys? And again... I have I have one of I bought one of their shirts and uh, you know I think those posters are, are all right for the most part I think I'm kind of shocked at the um, the artistic direction that they chose. Can you guys fuck this fucking sun? It's fucking bullshit, man. The wind. Oh, I hate this. All right, I'm gonna stand over here until this dies down. Um, I'm kind of surprised at the at some of those designs. They just do not feel for a dude who was so fucking original with what he was doing. It doesn't feel very original to me. It feels very like I don't know, just sort of like um, I, I just I just feel like there. I just was I was expecting more from from the reunion merchandise from the Misfits AD. We're going to talk more about what the the Misfits AD is and what. Uh, when I was doing, when I did um, Evil Live, Evil Lives, that uh, bootleg concert documentary thing, um, the the ninety minute thing from the Denver Riot Fest show, uh, I called it the Misfits AD because of this, because they had created this entity. Um, so, all right, so I talked about there was the legacy of brutality. There was that was the Glenn Danzig documentary, and they have hours. There are hours and hours of Danzig of Danzig footage that will never see the light of day. This dude has all this Danzig footage. He's just sitting on it. Uh, he went into Glenn's house and filmed Glenn in his house doing stuff. There's footage of Doyle. Um, there's just all this stuff, and it's just never going to come out. It's never, ever going to come out. That was being made, I think, between the year 2005 and 2008, maybe. Hey, Terry, what's going on? Um, thank you, Tim. Yeah, it's, this, is a, this is a very beautiful piece of, of, of land. Uh, this is where my brother lives. Um, and so, whew, what was I saying? Right, so the so other failed misses projects. Then came a guy called uh, James Green Jr., uh, and he had a book called "This This Music Leaves Stains." He he, he reached out to me uh, uh, while he was in the middle of conducting his research. I forget what he why he reached out to me, but we, he had heard, because that's the thing, when you're doing a Misfits related project and you hear somebody else is doing a Misfits related project, you're like, whoa, who's this other guy doing a Misfits related project? I want to like, I want to know who, who, who he is, you know, I want to know, like, you know, I want to know what, what's going on. I want to make sure that we're not overlapping. You know, I remember when Paul Bazile was doing, um, uh, uh, Living the American Nightmare, 
which was his documentary about Mike Hideous, but he was interviewing all of the same people that I was interviewing. He interviewed Mr. Jim, and he interviewed Franche Coma, and he interviewed Bobby Steele, and I was trying to interview these guys. I'm going, what's up with this guy's project? And then he messaged, he reached out to me, and he's like, hey, I heard you're doing a Misfits project, I want to know more about it. Um, and that also, that, that project kind of uh, crashed and burned for a bunch of reasons that I, are not mine to explain. Uh, I will not get into it. Um, what else was there? So then James Green Jr., he's doing this book called This Music Leaves Stains. Um, and, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people in the misfit circle hate this fucking book. Hate this book because essentially, I'm not, I've not read the book personally. I'm not going to slam the book until I've read it. I'm just regurgitating what I've heard from other people. But what I've heard is that this book is essentially someone, he, he, basically it's just like a, a, a narrative version of, of Mark Kennedy's work on Misfit Central, something like that, um, with a bunch of uh, supplemental interviews, um, but not from Bobby Steele or any of the other auxiliary members of, of the Misfits. Uh, and yeah, so there are people out there who really dispel that book. They really do not like that book. I've actually heard it's written really well. Like the writing is really, really great. Uh, I definitely want to read it at some point. Uh, I think the reason why I haven't picked it up yet is because honestly, when I heard that it's basically all the, the material from Misfit Central, I just kind of, I don't know. I just didn't, I, it didn't interest me. I just was like, okay, I don't know. I don't want to read what I you know, what are we ultimately always looking for? New tidbits of information. We just want to hear the, the, the untold, we're, we're always, we're like archeologists, you know, we want to, we're archeologists dealing with people that do not want to uh, relive their history in any way, shape or form, mainly Glenn Danzig, um, Jerry to a less extent. And now it's like Bobby, you know, from, you know, I was looking at Bobby Steele interviews. That dude does not give interviews anymore. Well, he does, but he, he does not want to talk about the misfits anymore. He only wants to talk about the undead. I don't blame him though. It's like, Two years of his life being a misfit versus 30 years of life, you know, doing this band, The Undead, and all anybody ever wants to ask him about is the misfit stuff. He just wants to talk about The Undead. I respect that. I totally understand that. And I'm glad that I interviewed him when I did. I interviewed him, I interviewed him three times, two hours apiece. So I got a lot of Bobby Steele in the can, um, and hopefully it's usable. I remember the audio on one thing being really shitty. I don't know. Uh, Tim says, I have that book. That's exactly what it is. Guys, I can't see your comments. So please forgive me. I'll go back and I'll look through the comments. This, is, this show is super haphazard. Super haphazard matter. By the way, I just want to quickly take a moment and shout out. Fuck, I don't. I'm on my phone. I can't look it up. There are uh, several people bought me cups of coffee. I want to salute you and thank you. I don't have your names. Um, but but in the next episode uh, or the episode after that when I'm back home and I have access on my computer or I can go on my phone and look it up, I will make sure to take note, as I always do in these episodes, you all deserve um, to be uh, shouted out uh, for your contribution. And I appreciate, um, I appreciate you supporting me as I try to create content. Uh, I'm thinking about taking things to the next level. And what I mean by that is um, there is a piece of merchandise that I want to create uh, surrounding my project. I promise we're going to get to scream to me, guys. I just on a, I'm just I'm on a roll right now. I'm just talking about stuff. Um, there is a, a piece of merch. I don't know if I'm going to make it yet. I'm going to see. I'm going to figure this out. Uh, oh, that's right. Yo, Tim. Tim is saying here. Uh, I have that book. That's exactly what that is. He's talking about this music leave stains, the book by James Green Jr. And he's saying that it's basically rewriting Misfit Central, and he says that's exactly what it is, and he says, Scream With Me is way better. Well, I wouldn't know that, Tim, because I have not looked at the book yet, and that's what we're doing today. I have the book with me, and we're going to look through it. But before I get there, ah, burying the lead again. Um, yeah, so my idea is that I want to do a t-shirt, and instead of asking people to buy me a cup of coffee, I want to create this t-shirt, and that will be a way to support the creation of this art. Um, in closing, about in closing about projects about the misfits uh, trying to come out, um, it's it's a challenge, and you know I'm not gonna lie. I too have been I've been very frightened about how how to tell this story that I want to tell, and that's part of the reason why I put I put it down for so long because I got to a point. I said I got to a point where I hit a brick wall, I wasn't getting the interviews that I wanted, and I said, well, if I can't have something that's perfect, then I don't want anything at all. 
Um, and that's definitely true. But the other part of that too is like, you know, facing the juggernaut that we're about to briefly discuss, you know, it's like, it seemed like an impossibility to me. And now I have found a loophole. I think I've figured out a way that will allow me to tell the story that I want to tell, which is this documentary, They Came From Lodi. And I told myself, as I've said in the past, and I swear to all of you, I, I, made, a, I made a promise to myself. I said, no matter what happens, I will never let this project be stifled in any way, shape, or form. It will come out, whether I can sell it and commercially, because that's what I ultimately, what every artist wants to do. They want to sell their art um, you know, commercially and, and, and make money from the art that they create. I want to create a documentary in the story that I'm telling. Um, even if I can't do that, I'm still going to release this fuck there. Nothing is going to stop this thing from coming out. And if it means like just putting it out as a fucking torrent, you know, and just letting it be torrented for free, uh, then that's what will be. Um, but I am not, I made a promise that I would finish this and release this fucking thing. And I will do as you can tell from 1979, uh, the, the other thing that I'm doing, this, this takes a lot of time. But since I'm unemployed, I have more time to work on it. Um, a quick update about 1979 before Scream With Me. Uh, so uh, we did, if you were in the Facebook group, you got to see a preview of the beginning, the intro. Uh, a rough cut of the intro of uh, 1979, A Year in Horror Business. Um, it was well received. I think uh, people enjoyed it. Like I said, you know, there were some people that were bummed. They're like, "Where's, where's the revelations? Where's the new phrase?" Was like, "Dude, there is no revelations. It's not about revelations. At least this is not about revelations. It's about taking the, it's about taking the information and presenting it in a very interesting visual way. And that's what that's all that was being done with it. That's it. That's it. Really, truly, there might be a couple of of slight like eureka, like, whoa, I didn't realize that, or whoa, what an interesting connection, but that's not what it's about. It's about essentially getting a proto-documentary. In, re in reality, it's... So, so, putting that on the shelf. So, all those things, be aware, more is coming, more is... Uh, but today, I want to talk about so as I said, there were a lot of failed books. And there's even more. There's another book that came out. Um, okay, so there's another series that I'm not familiar with, although I just became friends with the dude. Some of you might know him. He's in the Fiend Collectors. One of the, He started the Fiend Collectors uh, group. It's amazing how we have all our little misfit communities. There's like Keep On Danzig. There's They Came From Lodi. There's the Seventh House People. There's just interesting. But the, there's a Fiend Collectors group. And this guy, Mike, um, he's writing a book called, or he's writing a series called On Earth As It Is. Like that. Somebody, somebody correct me here. Um, Chud played a show in Delaware on Saturday. Yeah, I briefly saw it. It was very pathetic. Uh, Dr. Chud played to like five people. Uh, it was sad, man. I, it, it was really, really sad. Um, yeah. One thing that you can say about Michael Graves that you can't say about Dr. Chud, Michael Graves put out a whole bunch of music and Dr. Chud put out one album in how many fucking years? Jesus Christ. Uh, hold on, I'm looking at these comments here. Connection is shaky. Is the connection still shaky? I hope it's not. Scream With Me is now two copies of Teenagers from Mars. Damn, Jeffrey, you lucky mother effer. Um, yes, it is soon to be. It's not out of print yet, guys highlight about Scream With Me right now. Uh, you can still support uh, the authors of the book uh, Scream With Me by going to Barnes & Noble, by going to Amazon.com or certain brick and mortar bookstores. There's one in, in Philadelphia. Um, uh, and picking up a copy of this now out of print book. Uh, meaning they're not going to keep reprinting it. If you're just joining us and you would like to support the creation of this content, there are links uh, where you could click, you could buy, uh, support this content by buying me a cup of coffee. I've recently lost my job. Or go to my website, www.fromus.com. Click on some of the ads, uh, throws pennies in the AdSense account. Last week, um, when we talked about Michael Graves, I did not put those links there because I thought it was inappropriate um, considering what we were talking about. And I just didn't feel comfortable having those links out there because we were talking about like some serious deep shit and it just didn't feel right to put my stuff out there. But now that we're talking about something more positive, 
uh, relatively speaking, I'm saying that information now. And thank you to everybody who has supported. Uh, I'm going to find those names and, and shout them out in the next interview. Uh, when you do so, there we go. There we go. Not touching it. I am not touching this device. It is staying where it is unless I'm showing you the stuff. This thing is so volatile. It keeps just shutting off on its own. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what the hell is happening anymore. Uh, very frustrating to say the least. I'm very sorry. I want to apologize. I wish I things were not so spotty out here. Uh, all right. I'm just going to keep talking. I'm sorry. I know I'm repeating myself. I'm probably not going to share that other thing. Okay. So there have been a lot of projects. I hate repeating myself. I hate repeating this shit over and over again. Okay. There were a lot of projects, misfits related, that never made that never made it um, to the finish line. Some did. Um, this music leaves stains by James uh, Green Jr. managed to do it. It's based off of Misfit Central. It's very uh, paltry. It's very light. It's only about a hundred and something pages. Very very uh, under a hundred thirty pages. Let's put it that way. Uh, and it covers thirty five years and a hundred and something pages. It's just not very detailed. Um, and a lot of the information was already known on Misfit Central. So a lot of Misfits, uh, auxiliary, people that are either in the Misfits or surrounding the Misfits kind of think the book is kind of bullshit. Um, there was Living in the American Nightmare, which was uh, Mike Hideous's thing. There was Danzig, A Legacy of Brutality That Will Never See the Light of Day. Uh, that filmmaker walked away from the project. I spoke to that filmmaker on the phone and he told me about the process of trying to make a documentary with Danzig and, and all that had happened. Um, there's... Danzig and, and some of Doyle, because da Doyle had, you know, started playing shows with Danzig, um, that will just never see uh, the light of day. I think that's when, I think that's when he told me that, so Doyle had gone to Glenn's father's funeral at the behest of Gorgeous George, which is how they, links back up, whatever. Um then there is, there's the Misfits book. We talked about that already. You'll see that in the first part of this thing. There's the Misfits book. Um, there is, what else is out there? So there's a book. This is very interesting. So there's a book of photography. You can find it somewhere. And it's uh, it's like 35 photos of the Misfits at Max's Kansas City in 1978. Somebody basically took their roll of film that they shot of the Misfits, probably threw it in a closet forever, completely forgot that they had it and then go, whoa, look at all these photos uh, that I took of the Misfits. Realized that the Misfits, you know, are, are an incredibly popular band and, and, and made a little book out of it. And that book has been uh, apparently selling like hot cakes. You can find it on Amazon. Um, I've not looked through it. I don't know if there's any like actual text or if it's just photos. It's a very short booklet. It's like 34 pages or something. Very, very short. Um, and it's just the Misfits. It's just a, like a photo, a photo essay of the misfits at Max's Kansas City. Really cool, I think really cool stuff. And I think that because it's the photographer put it out, um, there's no issue, which is how Erie Vaughn, you know, kind of was able to put out his book um, slightly. Uh, the, uh, the Misery Obscure was able to, you know, make it past the gate because all of those photos were his. He took, he took the photos, he owns the copyright of the photos. And I guess that was enough to allow him to publish that book. He did that book with Tom Begowitz, who who wrote as the primary author or the, the, the main author of Scream With Me. Why is, ah, there's the comments. Okay, good. Um, yes, Rue, yes. Uh, and Misery Obscure is another great book. Uh, it's great. And what's cool about that is that it's like, it's eerie taking you through... Um, his time with Misfits, Sam Hain and Danzig, but from his point of view, you probably all already know about that book already. It's nothing new, right? It's not new material. It's, it's, it's uh, 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 everybody, that book has been out for 10, almost 10 years now, close to it, something like that. Um, I think it came out in 2011, actually. 2010, came out in 2010. Um, oh, that's interesting. Umberto says, Umberto, who we're going to be mentioning here very shortly, says, it was Jerry's girlfriend that took the photo, the Max's photos. Wow, that is, I did not know that. Well, she put out a little book and she has not so far had any problems. Then there's a series from this guy, Michael Goodman, and he runs uh, Fiend Club Collectors or Fiend Collectors Club or something like that. 
um, a great resource. And he also, there's a Fiend website, a Fiend Collector's website that he runs as well. And those guys have been, in the way that we like, like scrutinize over the minutia that is the Misfits, um, you know, in 77 to 83, those dudes like have scrutinized uh, over the records and the collector's aspects of things and put out some books themselves. And one of them is called On Earth As Is In Hell or On As In Hell or something. Very limited run runs of these books. And uh, once they're sold out, they're sold out. They're working on a second volume right now. Uh, keep your eyes peeled for it. You can find out more information about that in their Fiend Club group. So shout out to those guys. Uh, I've not had a chance to look over any of that material. I would very much like to be very interested to uh, they, but they basically like figured out that like the pressings are all not right. They're all inaccurate. That the, the and that was part of what Mark Kennedy had told me when he had interviewed Glenn Danzig. You know, um, he said that at the time, Glenn is, yo, what's up, Alberto? How are you? Um, what he said was, uh, Glenn at the time when he was interviewing him that Glenn was just sort of like throwing out like bullshit information in the sense of like it's almost as if he didn't want people to know stuff he wants it to be a mystery and so he told Mark Kennedy in his when Mark Kennedy's like trying to do his research with Glenn when Glenn glance, grants in this interview this is like the first time that Glenn is like acknowledging people trying to like write history about him in any way shape or form uh, Glenn tells Mark Kennedy, that there are 10 copies of Halloween on green vinyl from Glenn Danzig himself to Mark Kennedy. And, you know, Mark thought it was bullshit. He thought it was totally bullshit. You know, there was no, there was no, no possible way to know if that was true. Um, and so, and so uh, uh, clearly there's some, you know, there's some side of Glenn where he wants he wants people to like not know the truth or he wants, it's like creating chaos in a, he's creating chaos to create mystery in a way, I think. And a great example, again, if you're thinking about like the record collecting side of things, it's like instead of just printing black vinyl or like red vinyl or, you know, pink vinyl or yellow vinyl or whatever, he's not cleaning the stampers and he's having them mix pellets. So you're getting the swirled vinyl and the swirled vinyl becomes both a problem and a, a endless, uh, an endless engaging, interesting quest to document and catalog and inspect these pieces of vinyl, these discs um, with various different swirls and, oh, this one has more green than this one. This one has marbled gray. This one's really gray. This one has black streaks. This one has a red streak. Oh, this is a, p a pink. There's only ten, like 15 pink copies of Legacy of Brutality because some were red and some were black and they mixed together or, or, or whatever and mixed them all together or no, it was red and white. Um, the point is, is that it creates like, it creates like this beautiful chaos of like, look at all this, like, why, what? Like we start asking ourselves, why, why this? Why, why that? Why did he do this? So Glenn is like, Glenn's like a man of mystery in that sort of way. And Glenn's a guy who clearly doesn't give a shit about history on the sense that like, he doesn't care about documenting. He doesn't even care about like, you know, remastering shit. Like look at the fact that like the Sam Hain albums have built, this whole, his entire Sam Hain catalog has been out of print for you know, for years and years and years and years. And I believe Glenn owns, owns that stuff, you know? So why, why is it out of, why is it, why is that in print? Why doesn't he repress that? There's such a, there's such a demand for, for Sam Hain vinyl. There's such a demand that people are bootlegging shit, you know? They're bootlegging all this stuff. They probably would be bootlegging it anyway, but like they're bootlegging it even more because they're just like, there's, there's no other way to get it. And people want to own it. You know, people want that shit. I have, I'm not going to lie, I have, I have a bunch of, uh, you know, you've seen them on this show, my Misfit 7 Inches, right? I have like a bunch of them. I got them at Generation Records. They were all bootleg. I knew they were bootleg. They were eight bucks a piece. Uh, I know some probably look down upon that, but as a fan, as someone who wants these songs on vinyl and wants like these, 
these seven inches that I've done so much, you know, that I've heard so many people talk about, but can't afford to own. Like, cause you know what it would cost to own an original bullet or an original cough cool? I'm never gonna be able to do that. It's not, it's, I don't have the money. I don't have the ability, but you know what? Like just to like spend eight bucks or seven bucks and have it and just have it on my wall or have it to look at because it's so beautiful and those covers are like art to me. It like, it means so much to me. And, um, and so I have no problem, no qualm doing that. So it's like, why is it Glenn? Why? Why don't you do this? Why don't you put it out? Why don't you put out, um, <laughs> why don't you repress bullet? Why don't you read it? Like people will buy this shit. Um, the point is that this dude does not really seem to care that much. Um, but yet at the same time is super controlling of his image. We talked about in the first part of this broadcast before it got broken up and fucked up. Um, Glenn, you know, all the times that Glenn was struggling, he's struggling with bootlegs, he's struggling with Jerry, he's struggling, uh, he was struggling with blank records. You know, uh, he's struggling with, with Rick Rubin, um, you know, fighting him over producing on this, on the, the Danzig three and Danzig four, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Alberto says, yeah, there's one on eBay right now. Yeah. There's a cough cool right now on eBay. That's going for $2,000 on the flip side of that. Somebody bought a cough cool, an original cough cool for $20. Could you imagine $2,000 and, and Rocky, uh, Jerry and Doyle's brother, he went to school with a box of cough cools and was just handing them out to all his friends to promote his brother's band. Each one of those, those discs could like, you know, that's like a trip to Hawaii. You know what I'm saying? Um, fucking went all over the place with this shit tonight. I'm sorry, guys. This is just, this is a chaos, but you know, I'm trying to deliver an episode here. It's just, it's tough. Um, I'm not in my familiar elements. There's no blinking lights behind me, you know? Um, so, so he, they don't really care. It's like they care, but they don't really care at the same time. So when anybody else tries to do cool shit about this band, they shut it down. Because they're gonna, like, we're going to be the only ones. Look at what happened with Plan 9. Uh, in order for Glenn, Glenn, that was Glenn's label, right? Glenn brought that label up from nothing. From nothing. From like, from Bullet. All the way up to like, he, he's now sold his catalog to Caroline. And they're fucking distributing the catalog, you know? He's, 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 uh... He's doing all these great, great things. And then what happens as a result of this lawsuit? He has to dissolve Plan 9. Plan 9 goes away. He has to create a new la uh, label, Evil Live. The point, or no, not yet. That came even later because uh, he went to Deaf American. Point is, is that like, this is a dude who has integrity as an artist. Even though I think he's gotten, they've gotten un unoriginal with their new merch. He has integrity. In the sense that like whatever he's going to do, he has to A, own it in entirely 100% and he has to make all the decisions. He has to live and die by those decisions. Look at, look at Veronica. Verotic, Veronica, the movie, you know, everybody's shitting on this movie. I have not seen it yet, but I'm sure when I do, we'll have to do a review of that. Um, but what does he do on Veronica? He directs it. He wrote it. He produced it. And he was a camera operator. You know what I'm saying? Like he wants to, every, he has to have his fingers in absolutely everything, whether it's going to hurt the art or it's going to make the art better. He, no matter what, it's going to be Glenn. It's going to be Glenn's thing. Didn't Glenn and Jerry re-release Walk Among Us in a different, yeah. So Alberto, they don't have control of Walk Among Us. That's why it was never in the box set in the 90s. Slash Ruby Records or whatever, they own Walk Among Us. And so it's actually them who's doing that. That. Glenn and Jerry do not have uh, uh, any say uh, over Walk Among Us. And so that's why you have like Slash being like, okay, let's release the same album again, but in seven different colors. And they'll probably do eight different colors and nine different colors. You know, they're never going to stop pressing up Walk Among Us because they know they can make money. And that pisses, probably pisses Glenn and Jerry off to no end. I don't think they can, there's nothing they can do about it. They have like an iron, there's, there's a contract. Um... So these guys are very, very, very protective of their image. They're very protective of the crimson. Look at the crimson ghost. Look at what happened to the crimson ghost. Now, the the branding it, it it exploded. Everybody put the crimson ghost on everything, whether they have permission or not. They're putting stuff. They're putting. They're they're using this mark that the misfits developed. Even though they didn't create it, they're the ones that made it big. They're the ones that that brought that made it what it is today. Right. So in fact, they like. They're responsible for the the goodwill that this that this mark brings, and I think that they also get confused. They look at things that are like good and positive, and like 
are like, fuck this thing because it has the Crimson Ghost and the Crimson Ghost is ours. Case in point, scream with me. Still in the bag that I bought it. The, mis the misfits, Glenn and Jerry, see this. They see the Crimson Ghost here and they fucking flip a shit because they're like, that's our fucking logo. What the fuck? You can't do it. Forgetting about the fact that this is a this is a fucking documentary book. It's documenting their history. You know, it's fair use, man. Like, they're, they're called the Misfits. The Misfits have a skull. And, you know, that's their symbol and they're putting it on the book. Does it help sell the book? Of course it helps sell the book. But, I mean, it's like, here's a situation where I feel like they're just like so, uh, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's, it's unnecessary. I don't know. Um... Okay, before we dive into this, before we really dive into this one, I have not opened this. I have not seen what's inside. I don't know. I don't know any. I just bought it. I wanted to buy it when it first came out. Um, I was going to buy it recently. Then I lost my job. Uh, I did not, um, I didn't feel it was responsible to buy it again. And then when you guys started to um, send me, uh, when you guys started buying me cups of coffee, uh, I used some of that money to purchase this book. Because I thought, A, um, I really want this book. B, I would do something with this book on this show. And therefore, it warranted. Uh, it was a good purchase. And C, apparently it really is. Because now it's very soon to become a collector's item. And so we're going to talk about this. And we're going to sort of discover this book together. I'm going to discover. You're going to watch me discover this book. Uh, Jerry is the living principle of capitalism. You know what, Manuel? I, I can't listen. Here's the thing about Jerry. And here's the thing... Here's the thing about Glenn, but really about Jerry. You, the only thing you can, you can accuse Jerry of, and maybe Glenn by a small example, uh, a small extension of, sorry, that came out all jumbled. The only thing you can include those guys of, really mainly Jerry, is bad taste. Sometimes, and for you know, quite a period of time, especially when Jerry didn't have Glenn, um, you know, uh, sort of like... Uh, giving his two cents on things, Jerry, Jerry made a lot of bad decisions. You know, um, he, and what I mean by bad decisions, I mean, artistically in the sense of like bad taste, he, do, he does things in bad taste sometimes. Um, I, I think everything that he does, whether it's, whether he's motivated by capitalism or not, everything that he does comes from a, a place of love, you know, a, a place of like wanting to proudly continue and build the brand that he had a hand in starting, you know, uh, and so I think the only thing you can really accuse Jerry of is bad taste. Look at The Devil's Reign, a perfect example. Here's Jerry wanting to put out an album, continue on the fucking misfits and their legacy. Uh, and he puts out the, Devil Reign, the Devil's Reign with that music and wants to call that The Misfits. Bad taste, Jerry. Bad taste, but beautiful intentions, beautiful heart. You know what I mean? He's got heart, man. You know, like you can't, I, I can't, I can't blame him for that. I really don't. I, I think... I think it's beautiful. And um, yeah, I don't know. And, and you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or, or even five years ago, you know, I'd probably get a lot of hate. Be like, oh, you're fucking Jerry. You, you know, you uh, Jerry, Jerry's destroyed the name, dra dragged the misfits to the mud, blah, blah, blah. Fuck you, fuck you. It's just like, it's like, no, man, the dude is, the dude created this shit. The dude wants to, you know, commercially, you know, uh, use it, exploit it. And uh, he just does it. I, I, he does it in a way that does not align with good taste um, or the taste of his fans. That's it. Uh, and now that Glenn is back, right? I think that like that helps things a lot, right? You know, uh, that makes things a little bit better. Um, so yeah. All right. So let's look at this book. Now, can you, is the book backwards when I do this or is it frontwards? I can't tell. To me, right now, looking back at me, it says "Scream with me." It's it's. It, what does it look like to you guys? Does it read properly? Because if not, I'm gonna have to flip this camera, and we're gonna have a whole new set of problems. So, somebody, please answer me right now, right now, please answer me. Somebody, somebody, on this episode that we are affectionately titling, it's if you're gonna ski, ski with me, right, Russell? Um, please, somebody, comment and let me know that this book is. What's the? Can you see the the titles? Flip it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's all I wanted to hear. Okay, I heard it. Okay. Backwards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, there was a delay. There was a delay, everybody. I couldn't see. I couldn't see. All right, we're going to we're gonna do this. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to flip it over. We're going to open this book. Hold on, let me just... 
trying to figure out the best way to do this. All right, let me let me pull that right there. Okay, and we're gonna flip it. There we go. Okay, and we're gonna look at this book together. Okay, here it is. Wow. All right, how am I gonna do this? <laughs> it's gonna be tough. Right there, scream with me. Scream with me. Now it looks better, right? So now I'm opening it. Scream with me. The Enduring Legacy of the Misfits, 1977 to 1983. There it is. It's written by Tom Begowitz, Jeremy Dean, and Jeremy Dean with Umberto. Umberto, I don't know if I'm saying your name wrong, but please forgive me if I'm saying the name wrong. Umberto de Urso. So it's published by Abrams Books. Um, and then on the back cover, we have the Static Age right here. It's really cool. Uh, Night of Living Dead Skulls, Violent World, Horror Hotel, Ghoul's Night Out, American Nightmare. It's pretty sweet. Pretty, pretty, pretty sweet. Um, and that is from... I don't know what the hell that's from, actually. What is that from? That, I don't know. I don't actually know. Okay. I'm trying to wait for some of you motherfuckers to, hey, Umberto, since you're here, what is this? What is this from here? Is that the back of, it looks like the back of Walk Among Us, but what is that? And there seems to be a dog. Look at this. There's like a dog, or is, is that the rat bat spider right there? Maybe? I don't know. All ages. It's a book for all ages. It's published by Abrams. You can get this book on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. It is currently out of print. Whatever copies are left are available. That's it. Once you can't get it, retails for 30 bucks. Support uh, support the creation of this beautiful art, whether the misfits are happy about it or not. Um, oh, that is the Walk Among Us label. But, you know, I don't... Umberto, but it says American Nightmare. Why is American Nightmare on there? It must be, was it this the Plan 9 version of Walk Among Us? That's the only thing that, that I could imagine. Um, real quick, again. So, Tom Begowitz, you'll, re you'll recognize this name. Because Tom uh, was the dude who uh, designed, did the design of the Misfits box set and put out Static Age. And I've done... I've interviewed Tom. Tom is in my movie as well. All right, I'm finally fucking opening this bad boy up. Um, so normally I would not, I'm, I would not like sort of do this because this book, I would, I would tell you, fuck you all, like go buy this book. Um, oh, John says it's from the Boston Flyer. Thank you, John. Uh, so normally I would tell you to all go like, don't like, like go buy this book. I'm not going to show you the inside of the book, but the book is out of print now. So some of you may never get to buy this book. I say go out and buy this book no matter what, but uh, we're just going to look at it anyway, okay? So, sorry, guys. That's just what we're going to do. So, Scream With Me, The Enduring Legacy of the Misfits by Tom Begowitz and Jeremy Dean with Umberto. Umberto, how do you say your last name, buddy? Um, don't get mad at me. Umberto de Urso. De Urso? Uh, featuring the collection, featuring the collection of archivist Umberto de Urso, Additional contributions courtesy of the Dave Walling Collection with Andrew Unstead, Susan Hannaford. So Susan Hannaford is, um, she ran the Mad Monster Movie Club at Club 57 in 1979. And the horror, uh, Halloween, the Halloween 7 Inch is dedicated to um, Susan, uh, Alf Berg and uh, Carol Stockard. Forward by Shep Ferry. He's a de he's like a designer of some kind, an artistic designer, and an interview with Kirk Hammett. Dude, you guys, this is so big. We're not gonna be able to get through it all. Okay. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to do this nicely. There's a little bit of a gloss here, so we got our, our contents. Looks very pretty. Woo! Seventy-seven to eighty-three. You got uh, all the chapters divided up. This is what I, you know, this is, Umberto, this is what I wanted to do with my documentary. I, I, I had that idea too, Umberto. 
I mean, I guess everybody has that idea, right? It's like, how else would you divide up the chapters? Because like we said, the, 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 the band is divided up. The band is divided up by, you know, like each one of these <laughs> band, each one of these records is like a different band. You know, I mean, not all of them. Like, you know, that one's a, di- that, hey, that one's a different band from that one. <laughs> that one's a different band from that one and that one. You know what I'm saying? Like, they're all different bands. So it's like, of course you need to use the records as chapter markings, you know, it's, it's different, different chapters, different eras, uh, fan club, the, uh, the fiend club and more that, that was good. That was a good way. And then look at this posthumous 1984 to 2001. And then you got right. Die, die. My darling was released way after the band. And you have to think, you know, most people don't really pay much mind to die, die, my darling, because it later got lumped in with earth AD and, um, fucking, uh, wolf's blood. But, Die Die My Darling was like this weird last release in the seven inch, right? It was like, it was, it was an unreleased song with two other cuts that had never been heard. Mommy, Can I Go Out and Kill Tonight? We Bite and Die Die My Darling. They were not on anything. So if you, if you got Die Die My Darling in 1984, you're like, you're seeing, you're seeing something else. You know, you're seeing something brand new. Um, yes, I agree, Tim. Uh, Umberto is a rock star. This is such a, this already I'm loving this book and I haven't even opened it yet uh what else we got here they 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 talk about uh legacy of brutality which is of course as we all know that's glenn uh re-recording over everybody else's parts and then uh putting it out as like a retrospective uh, but i love legacy of brutality i love those 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 versions collection one evil live uh lp now oh right because it came out as an album in 1987 and originally it came out in 82 as the fiend the 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 seven inch version so i guess the lp was the 12 inch version uh collection two which um is actually also sort of a secret sam hain record if you want to think about the fact that you know or has a secret sam hain recording and the fact that both glenn and erie went in and re-recorded a bunch of misfit songs um We've spoken, we've spoken about that before. Uh, then you have the box set. That's what Tom, Tom, the, the art, the whatever, Tom, who, who, who put this book together with Umberto and, uh, uh, that other dude, what's his name? Um, and Jeremy, uh, they, <laughs> he did the, 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 the collect, uh, the box set, uh, static age. And he also did 12 hits from hell, which was never, uh, 12 hits from hell, which was never released. Okay. Moving on. Whoa. All right. I'm not going to read all this. Maybe we'll come back and look at it, but here uh, I'll save the content for those who buy the book. Okay, calling Shepherd Fairy. He's a he's a a, a visual graphic artist. He did a, a Jerry only obey. He's a famous guy who did the obey stuff. That was a great idea to get him to do the forward. Look at that. That is fucking pretty. So fucking cool. I can't wait to read this. I'm not going to read it now. Uh, let you, whoever that, that's something we'll leave for those who buy the book. Okay. We'll look at the pictures, but not, and then we have an interview with Kirk Hammett of Metallica. Very appropriate. Very wow. That, what a get that was, man, to get someone from Metallica. Whew, that was a good, I wonder who got Umberto. I'm sure you can't reveal that, but I wonder who, who got that interview. That that's a great, probably Tom. I'm guessing somebody got that interview. Um, special thanks to Brant wheel. I'm going to guess it was Brant. Who, who put who connected you guys with Kurt? Who knows? Uh, so here's an interview about that. And then, like, why is an interview from Kurt so important? Kirk, Kirk, K. Why is an interview from Kirk so important? Because if it wasn't for Metallica, you know, who knows? Who knows how how much recognition the Misfits would have? Metallica, um, along with Guns N' Roses and a few other things, made them. Uh, burst open uh, on a worldwide scale while they were, you know, uh, secretly still uh, boiling in the underground. So then we have, this is cool. There's like this uh, sort of matte, this matte finish. You have the Misfits. There's the original. That's the original logo right there. And you have, uh, that's cool, dance contest. The Ritz. Really cool. Okay, so you have the Misfits, Undead, and Heart Attack right there. The 17th of December. This is when... Uh, the alternate lyrics of teenagers from, oh, actually, Jeremy knew Kirk's manager. Ah, that's great. What a great connection, huh? Um, this show right here is where um, the alternate lyrics to teenagers from Mars come from, where they call Bobby Steele a bunch of really uh, inappropriate things. Um, and that was <laughs> the only time that the Misfits and the Undead played together, uh, I believe. Okay. 
Look at this. The keyboard version of She is one of the finest moments. There's an element of weirdness to it that is hard pressed to find later on. Yeah, so this is uh, Dennis from Refused, which is a, a punk band uh, from somewhere in the world. I don't know where. Uh, and then you have here, we have 1977 blank. Look at that. All the information from blank seed. That's what I was talking about, blank records. Side A, Cough Cool. Side B, She. The lineup is Glenn Danzig, Manny, and Jerry Kayafa. But notice that they even misspelled his name right here. And this is why, this is why, um, <laughs> this is why Jerry wanted to be known as Jerry only. Only Jerry. I only want to be known as Jerry. Uh-oh, I got a thumbprint on the book already. Damn it. Should have washed my hands. Son of a bitch. Got to be more careful. Um, But yeah, so it's for that reason that Jerry got his stage name Jerry only. And his son is known as Jerry Other, which I thought was a really cool continuation of that. Um, yeah. Okay. So turn the page. Woo! Is that pretty? Look at that. Look at that. All right. So that for a long time, this was the only photo that you could find of Manny. You know what I'm saying? Like you didn't. I love how Glenn kind of looks like uh, Mark Wahlberg in this in this photo a little bit. Um, and yeah, there's Manny. Look at him. They look so weird there, man. They look so 70s. So crazy. There's blank. So there's that's the first time. That's the first time that Glenn tries to do something artistically and it's stolen from him. You know what I'm saying? And so now he's like, then he creates plan nine. It's like the dude just every time the tried to, the dude tries to do something, he thinks people are trying to steal it from him. And he reacts. He reacts in like these like extreme ways. You know, I feel like he's just so over so extra about it, you know? I don't know. Um and then there's Jerry with his with his dark glasses. These dude Jerry can't see without his glasses, or he, he used to wear glasses uh, because he couldn't see without them. And yeah, as I just said, that's the only time that was the only photo of Manny for forever. Like you couldn't find anything about Manny. You didn't know that was just this photo. This is the one time you saw Manny. Uh, and here is the back. So they just love look at so, done so nicely. It's like a, this this book is like a museum. That's what it is. It's like a, a, a beautiful beautiful museum. And I guess. Ultimately, why did the misfits sue? Why did why did the misfits sue over this book? Right? It's like the misfits sue because they, they sued because they want to do the book themselves. That's what it ultimately comes down to. See, the thing is, after doing my own research uh, on some other things, I stumbled across the lawsuit and I read it. And ultimately, they were they they want they they're trying to put together their own book. And feel like this book. Oh, you just ordered a copy, Ralph? I'm so glad to hear that. Yes. All right. Umberto. Another copy sold. Um, so I guess I guess showing everybody the, the photos motivates people to want to buy the book. That's cool. Um, yeah. They want to do their own book. And uh, they felt that this was not this competed with that. Who knows? They said they, were, they had spent 30 years trying to put together material for a book. And I personally think that's a little silly. I don't know if that's true. Who knows? I'm not going to say it is true or isn't true. I just don't, I don't, I'm not really sure. Um, I don't know. Uh, so then there's the back of Cough Cool, right? Um, and it says, thanks to Marilyn, Clark, and Monty. Now, Marilyn and Clark and Monty, they starred in the movie The Misfits, right? They started, this was the first Misfits logo right here before they got the the, the cool later font, right? Um, and then Rainbow Studio is where they recorded it. Eddie's Lounge is where they did that live show that I was describing for you guys, their third show. Diane and Tom for Immoral Support. I don't know who Tom is, but Diane is the first bass player. That's Diane DiPiazza. The crowd, I don't know who the crowd is. Spectrum in Brooklyn. I guess, I think Spectrum is where they had it pressed. Just realize, however mad you think you are about what, is happening right now, I am a thousand times more frustrated in trying to just like look at this and like every time I touch the screen, it just this hap like it just shuts off. It just completely shuts off. I don't know if it's the Wi-Fi. I don't know what the fuck is going on, but it's very frustrating. And I'm very, very sorry to all of you that are seeing this like happen. All I want to do is just 
show you this content. I just want to like go over this with everybody. And it's just like, it, it, it's just really, really frustrating. I'm really frustrated right now. And I'm just, I'm very sorry. Very, very sorry. It's not my intention for this to happen. So I'm very sorry. We're going to keep going. What I'm going to do, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the videos off of Facebook. I'll, you know what? I'll borrow my brother's laptop. I'll take the videos off of Facebook. I will download them and I'll stitch them all together to make one clear, clean episode that can be rewatched. So if you don't feel like dealing with it or watching this now, uh, I will make sure to have it archived as one piece, okay? So don't worry about anything. Uh, let's go back. All right. Uh, and again, we've already had one book sale. I'm very happy about that for Umberto uh, and his constituents of Jeremy and uh, Tom. So here we go. Scream with me. Uh, going back, I'm going to start. So we, like I said, we're, we have the contents here. Forward by Shepard Ferry. Uh, interview with Kirk. Um, and it's presented in this interesting order. Really, really cool. All right, moving on. We, we talked about this already. I'm not, I'm not going to... We'll just, we'll just go back again. All right. We're just going to go back to the thing, right? So, okay. So here we are. We're going over. We went over this. This was so cool. Now here is a... Here is... Wow. You know what's so interesting? This is really, really interesting. They came from the Static Age. I had no idea. Holy shit. Wow. You know, this, this documentary is called They Came From Lodi. I had no idea there was a, this flyer. They came from the Static Age. They already fucking thought of it. How do you like that? It makes the title all the more appropriate, though. I'm really glad. So look at this early flyer. They came from the Static Age. And look at the aesthetic. There's That's the blank aesthetic that Glenn was going for. Sort of like the ransom letter, sort of like punk ransom letter aesthetic. Uh, and he continues it here in some early graphic design. Now, obviously, this is all done with Xeroxing. You know, he's like pasting stuff together and then Xero Xeroxing stuff. And here's the, the Misfits, man. Limited edition single. Look at that. Oh, I love it. So cool. Cough cool uh, with a she behind it. Blank records. Um, Desert Island song. So here we have Mark Kennedy, um, the guy who I was talking about before, the creator of Misfit Central, uh, talking about his Desert Island song. I fell in love with she when I heard uh, the legacy of brutality. And then I fell in love with it again when I heard the Cough Cool single. I love its historical significance. As the only song recorded at the band's first two, at the only song recorded at the band's first two recording sessions, yeah, that is pretty cool when you think about it. Uh, and there also is the third song, um, which I believe is "Harpies in the Night." Uh, look at this, "New Wave Hits Eddie." New Wave Hits Eddie. This is at Eddie's Rock Place. This is where, huh? So we have Eddie's Lounge. And this is Eddie's Rock Place. So this is the... Okay, so I'm sorry. So this is where the the, the Cough Cool single was first uh, sold. Was at this show. Eddie's Rock Place. This is the Misfits' um, third show. They did it with the victims. This is when uh, Franche Coma made his de debut. Um, the, the show started off as half uh, keyboards. It started off... There was Glenn behind keyboards. And then they switched to uh, guitar. And um, that was in October of 1977. This is the show that I listened to where they played a whole bunch of songs that have never been properly recorded. Um, and so, yeah, that's, there's Mark Kennedy. Very cool. You know, usually you think like, what kind of meal are you going to make out of the Static Age chapter? But they did a pretty good job. Now, this has some significance because this is where, this is the first place where this font, this logo was invented for this promo pick. Glenn then took this and he started using it everywhere, but it started here. And this is when Glenn also, he thought that Minor Threat had uh, sort of usurped the logo and um, <laughs> uh, uh, changed it to the Famous Monsters of Filmland logo, which you see on the Halloween single. Um, and it's just the coolest promo. And this is where, this is what Tom used for the cover of Static Age. And um, here, original... Blank Records poster featuring Franche, Manny, Jerry, and Glenn. So there's Manny. And when Tom, who who put this book together with Humberto and Jeremy, Jeremy, when he was doing the Static Age packaging, he uh, didn't even realize that he had Manny on the cover for Static Age and not Mr. Jim. 
Uh, even though I will admit, I'm, I'm sorry that Mr. Jim was not on it, but I'm really thinking, what a cool thing. When you think of Static Age, you think about the hands covering the face. Uh, and who knows why they were doing it. Maybe they were hiding the scars on their face when creatures rape their face and hybrids open up the door. Um, but it's a very cool, it's a very cool iconic image. And uh, I believe it was originally in green. Okay. And this is uh, Armand from Sick of It All with a, with a nice little little quote. I'm not going to read it. We'll save it. We'll save it for the, um, you can save it for uh, buying the book. So this is the Misfits' first show with, uh, no, not the first show. Sorry, that's the second show. Here's the first show, an audition so showcase. So they weren't even billed, right? CBGBs would do, you know, they would have big bands. And then people that were just starting out wanting to do original music, they would have audition showcases. And the Misfits uh, were the last to play an audition showcase on uh, Monday, April 18th. They, they played a Monday night uh, show uh, at CBGBs. And um, and then here you go. Then they opened again for the shirts right here. And that was also an audition showcase. And I believe they went on after the shirts. Um, they, they were the very last to go on, which which annoyed them greatly. Uh, and look at all the different bands you have on at CBGB's. So interesting to think that that's when they got their start. Uh, and here's again, here's another show for uh, Eddie's Rock Place. That's the third show, right? Oh, no, that's not the third show. Wait. Oh, you know what? Wow. Yeah, no. Wait, am I wrong? October 9th? Oh, because they're playing... So it's the Mixfits and the Victims. They're going to be playing October 9th and October 30th. Whoa, wait a minute. So that wasn't the Misfits' third show. It might have been their fourth show. Interesting. Did not realize that. Shows at 10 and 12. The Misfits and the Victims, November 19th. So before the Misfits uh, sort of became brother bands with... Black Flag and the Necros, they were, you know, synonymous with the victims. And the victims even put out a record on Plan 9. Um, Glenn used to live with members of the victims in New York City. And, uh, whoa, what is this? I never noticed that. Look at this Nazi friggin' lingerie. Some of that punk. I'm gonna be uh, edgy with some Nazi, Nazi, um, wow. That's so crazy. Trying to be like edgy punks, like Joey Image's uh, Nazi shirt at uh, uh, in 1979. Concert listings, v uh, venue ads from the Village Voice and the Soho Weekly. Wow. Oh, that's what that is, right? So this was in the Village Voice. And then he, this was for Eddie's Rock Palace. Um, this is for the October. Okay, so it was the 30th. Okay, there, there was a 30th show and the 19th show. And the October 30th show was the one with Franchi Como. So that's the one that I heard. The October 30th show. So that was their hollow, their first Halloween show. Um, interesting. And then Jay Harders. Boy, that is so crazy. I've never seen this flyer with the... Uh, this must have been... So this must have been an advertisement from something from Nazi Germany uh, that Glenn was repurposing. Oh, I hate this shit. Fucking punks, man. Fucking punks. Okay, here we go. So now, here's a whole thing from Paul Till. This is the photographer that I guess... I don't want to read all this now. This was one of their last shows, if not the last show at Shock Theater. It was ludicrously unsuccessful and poorly attended. Yeah, so that's what Manny told me. This was Manny's final show. And he left the band because of this show. And all the way up to Toronto to play. And um, Manny quit the band after that. That was it. I'll read this later. I'm not going to read this now. We're trying to get through this book before this thing craps out of me. What the fuck? Look at this. Wow, wow, look at that. Those are recording sheets for the Static Age. I'm so afraid to, like, fuck with this that it's going to, like, d disconnect again. Look at that. There you go. Come back. Look at that. Come back is spelled C-U-M back. That's crazy. She, 138, bullet, bullet with an I. 
Oh, the last it's it's they it's called the last caress in the in the in the notes. Theme for a jackal. Wow. Look at the takes they did. They did three takes for 138. They did three takes for she. They did two takes for comeback, one take for bullet. I'm sure they did more than that. Look at that. So there's this. That's uh, February 3rd, 1978. Dave Aleka is the mixer. No, Dave Achilles was the mixer. Sorry. Glenn ends along. Put that down. And then Glenn was like, no, no, no. It's the Misfits. It's the Misfits. From CI Recordings, the Take Sheets. Take sheets documenting the recording process song by song for the band's February 1978 sessions. C means complete take. FS means false start. Ink is incomplete. And insert means they recorded a section of music to potentially insert into another take. That's from Tom. Wow, Tom. Tom, this is so cool. So the third one was complete. So all the completes were circled. Look at that. They worked really fast. Second take was incomplete. The first take was complete. Uh, she, they did a false start, false start, and then the third take was a complete. Wow. Bullet. Complete. Insert. They took the second take. That was complete. Huh. Let's see what else we got here. Angel fuck. <laughs> Glenn Ann's alone. That's so great. I love it. Angel fuck, one take in the doorway, two takes. They used the first one, some kind of, some kind of hate. They did four takes. Now, one of these, shit, one of these takes for some kind of hate uh, is a, is an El very Elvisy take that Tom personally played for me. Because here's what you guys don't realize. Tom has these fucking takes on, his, on an iPod, and I got to fucking listen to some of them when I came over at Tom's house to interview him. He played for me a version of some kind of hate that was a more Elvisy vocal, and it blew my fucking mind. Teenagers from Mars, what does it say here? And we don't care. So there was originally like a, a parenthesis. We don't care. I don't like the Static Age Teenagers from Mars. I prefer the... Um, I prefer the, uh, the 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 horror business version, Hollywood Babylon. Look at that! They did a false start, then it was a complete, then another false start, and then the last take was a complete. Attitude: one false start, one complete. Now you can hear that false start on the um, you can hear the false start on uh, the static outtakes that Tom put together. See, Tom took a bunch of these takes and he put them all together in an eight minute like sort of medley of of the of uh for uh, as a bonus track for a static age so here hybrid moment complete followed by a false start followed by a complete followed by a complete static age hold what does it say hold complete choice which third one's a choice tv casualty a false start and a complete and that was done on, so that was done on uh, 2877, what? It says 2378, and then this one's 2877, that's weird. I don't understand why. I don't understand why speed 15, real number three, right? So that is real number one, that's real number two. Cool. Then Studio B. And then here, a note from Dave. You know, Umberto, how the hell did you track down Dave? I was looking for that motherfucker. I could not find him. I can't wait to read about this. This is going to be so cool. I'm not going to read it now. Maybe we'll do a second thing where we go back and, like, read about it. What's up, Pat? Back again. Uh, maybe we'll do that. We'll, we'll, we'll go back and we'll read some passages. All right, so now we come to bu the bullet chapter. This is so cool. 
Here's this dude. I don't Wayne Tain, Wayne Tain, Wayne Tain. That guy's a metal metal band, I think. Side A, you have Bullet in 138. Side B, Attitude in Hollywood Babylon. And now Jerry is Jerry only, not Jerry Kiafa, spelled wrong. Not Franche Coma, Mr. Jim. Fucking incredible lineup. Uh, Mr. Jim, who is by far the best drummer they ever had. Yeah. Yeah, Pat, that's your dad. Pat's dad. Pat, who's who's on with watching with us right here, is the son of uh, Franche Coma, uh, a.k.a. Frank Licata. Um, so that's really cool. Look at that. And now we're at plan nine. So Glenn has formed plan nine. So it's like, again, remember, so Glenn went from doing blank to plan nine, like the frustration of having to like sort of change because of like some outside interfering force. Glenn becomes very protective of his shit. And here we go. Look at this. Oh, look at that. One of the most iconic, disturbing, crazy ballsy fucking album covers ever created seven inch or otherwise it's just so it's just art man this photo was stolen glenn had jerry steal this photo from the local library and that's what they used. they took it out of a book and uh glenn added this the paint he added this splatter right here and they call it bullet Leave this effect is achieved where it looks what they did was they made a xerox of a xerox of a xerox of a xerox and that's what gives it a very like sort of uh, bold, saturated look. And what's interesting is now you can do that with Photoshop. You can just turn, that's just a dial you turn up. But back then you had to actually keep Photoshopping something over and over and over again to achieve that sort of look, you know? And then there's the back cover, there's the band. Now this would change, that's the first one. The se Oh, it's right here. The second one is Better Dead on Red. This is after Mr. Jim and Franche Coma have left the band, I believe. But the, when they were still in the band, this is what they had pressed up, and there's Jim, and there's Frank right there, and this is from uh, the, uh, an, an un, they did they took a bunch of takes that day and did a bunch of photos that day, so cool. Distributed by Orc, so Orc is Orc is Terry Orc, uh, who had um, his own record label, and Glenn wanted to originally have uh, Terry Orc put out Bullet uh, on Orc Records, and. Um, I don't think Terry did not want this on his record label, but he did agree to distribute it. So that's why it says distributed by Orc. Um, and then here is like this incredible lyric sheet for Bullet. And notice, look at the way that it's look at the way that it's been typed. Probably Glenn typed that on a typewriter. President's bullet ridden body in the street. Ride Johnny Ride. It's just done. It's done like beat poetry like like Glenn's Idol, who is Bukowski. Now, if you notice, and we didn't talk about this because the, the picture cut out. Let's go back here for a second. Um, notice, who does Glenn think at the bottom of right of this page? Bukowski. Because because Bukowski was, was Glenn's idol. And Glenn was trying to always write all these early Static Age lyrics are just Bukowski lyrics, man. He's just trying to do Bukowski. That's what teenage, t uh, Static Age and TV Casualty, that's what all these songs are. And there's Glenn's, that was Glenn's address in Lodi, 49 MacArthur. That's his parents' house right there. Um, and then later they would do a P.O. box. Now, Freddie, so you're like, who's Freddie? Freddie, that's Freddie Linzer, Freddie Shoes, Fat Freddy, Freddy Frump. He was a friend of Glenn's, childhood friend of Glenn's that sort of helped the band out. I wouldn't call him a manager. I tried tracking down Freddy forever. I could never get a hold of him. I don't know what happened to him. I have never found his presence. I've been looking for Freddy for 10 years. I've never been able to find him. Oh, we missed this flyer. There you go. CBGB's June 28th. But, you know, the thing is they're advertising this as like the misfits at CBGB's, but really this is just a, this is an audition showcase. That's all that is. You know, that's just, <laughs> where is it? Uh, here, that's all it is. It's it's just the shirts audition showcase. I wonder if Glenn even knew if the shirts were playing uh, back then at that time. Who knows? I don't know. Um, moving forward. So yeah, right. Shock Theater, Manny's last show up in Toronto. Since we have... Frank's son. There's a picture of Frank looking cool as fuck. Dude, I don't know why your dad never did. You know, Frank, Frank Licata was, Franche Como was doing a project called Franche and it never came out. Uh, when I went over to, to Frank's house, he gave me a shirt for Franche. I have to dig it up. I will dig it up and I'll show it to you guys. 
for a project that has never seen the light of the day, and it's Franche Coma's solo project, uh, his music that he wanted to uh, do. Um, so here we are. And then, kind of interesting that you... Oh, for Bullet... The, okay, so right. So yeah, this is Bullet. This was the second pressing. It was done in 1979. And this is when they're starting to include the, the Fiend Club fires. Detail, the meticulous detail, paying attention to this. It, it's amazing. Because this would technically be too early, um, having the Crimson Ghost here. Um, let's look at that. That's Bullet, 1979, second pressed. And Better Dead, so Better Dead on Red is uh, kind of like a play on Better Dead Than Red. Um, Better Dead Than Red is uh, was a, a communist saying from the 50s, like, you know, when everybody was like, super, like the Red Scare, people was like, it's better dead, it's better to be dead than to be a communist. So better dead than red. And, and Glenn changed it to be better dead on red. And you still see, so see the, the bullet hole from where uh, Kennedy was shot. And then he has this down here. It's so cool. I don't know where he got that that picture of Kennedy. I love the, the, the snub-nosed pistol, snub-nosed revolver. And it is copyright Static Age The Misfits. I guess it was static because he had Static Age music. So cool. You got a suck, suck, Jackie, suck. Arise, Jackie, yo. So cool. It's fucking art right there. All right, moving on. Misfits and the Victims. Um, Rick Riley of the Victims would play guitar for the Misfits on a few shows. Um, Barry Ryan of the mis of, of the victims would also play guitar for the misfits for one show at, uh, Max's Kansas city. And, um, they lived with, uh, Glenn in the city. So here's a flyer 57 club club 57. And that's Susan Hannaford. She is, uh, she is, uh, the, she was also the provider, uh, purveyor of the mad monster movie club, as I mentioned in the other thing. Um, and here's something from Sal from Electric Frankenstein. He's in my documentary. You guys, now here's something really fucking cool. Look at that. Look at that shit. Hand colored by Glenn himself. I've never seen green and purple and I've never seen yellow like that. Look at that. Whose collection is this, Umberto? This, is this yours or is this that other dude? That is unfucking real Look at that. Bullet, 1978, first pressing, silk screen jackets, hand colored by Glenn Danzig. Um, and then here's a Max's Kansas City. This is Sunday, December 3rd. Bullet, the pumping that up. And this was Bobby's first show with the band. Those are yours, Umber those are Umberto's. Unbelievable. What, what, how fucking rare. My God, those are probably... Those have to be more valuable than a cough cool, I would imagine. I would imagine. Ah, Rue, don't spoil it for me. I want to be surprised. Rue says on page 34, there's Joey Pill's signature um, when Joey Image was calling himself. Okay, this is interesting. So here, so this is something that Bobby had, but he had a torn version of it. And Umberto knows that because he bought Bobby's collection. Poster, look at that sucker. This is from February of 1979, right? And I've used this several times in, in you know, I filmed Bobby's poster. I, I, I took a bunch of video of Bobby's collection before he sold it to Umberto. So right before you bought it, Umberto, I videotaped a lot of it. Um, and I was doing all sorts of things. Right? I was starting with the skeleton and then working my way up to here. Ah, it's the best fans. She sees a skeleton. My God, you could see them on Tuesday, February 27th at Max's Kansas City. Oh, the Misfits! Dead. Um, Ken Barber. House. Oh my God, my prints. Jesus Christ, I've got to be so careful. These black matte pages. I'm getting these. Well, what? it's not like I'm ever going to sell this book. This is my copy. I dig the range of the Misfits and I should cover. All right, we're going to go back and look. Well, maybe we'll do a second episode where we look at some of the blurbs. I just want to look, focus on the photos. This is a poster that I, this is Bobby Steele's poster that Umberto uh, acquired, I believe. Am I right about that, Umberto? Was this Bobby Steele's poster? I bet it was. Um, this is Have a Merry Gory Christmas. And on Wednesday, December 20th, uh, 1978, right? 
78? Yes! 78. Okay, so what's cool about this is this show was recorded. This show... Oh, don't apologize, Rue. It's cool, man. I'm just I'm just breaking balls, bro. Um, this show was recorded by George Germain. And we... Yes, I knew this was Bobby's. Yeah, so I have a lot of video of this very poster that is being used for this book. Um, which you will see in 1979, actually. And um, yes, yeah, so like I said, this was this show was recorded by George Germain. It's very easy to find. You can find it on YouTube. Uh, Jerry and Doyle in the 90s uh, got the recording from George and then tried to re-record their gu guitar and bass. And I believe I've read it somewhere. They tried to record over the drums as well and just keep Glenn's voice. I don't know if that's true. And obviously the uh, that... Yeah. Christmas from this is the Blue Christmas show, but this is like got to be one of the best silk screened Misfits posters out there. It's just gorgeous. Uh, Umberto, this poster alone, having this poster, I, I hope you have this framed in your collection somewhere. I imagine that Umberto has some trophy room uh, in his house with all his his goody goody goodies in the Umberto collection. Uh, so that's really sweet. Oh boy. <laughs> It's like every, it's like, it's like every page I turn is like some like hidden treasure. It's so great. This is so fucking cool, man. All right, here, I'm going to stand the book up. Uh, I don't know how to do this. All right. Do like this. Okay. Um, so this is something, uh, this was also in, in, uh, this is also from, this is from, I think Bobby might have had one of these, but I know that Franche Coma had one of these. Uh, Frank Licata had one of these. And yeah, Robbie, I knew it. Yeah, Dr. Dud uh, did do overdubs on that show, and it sounds horrible. Um, but yeah, this is in possession of Franche Coma, and I guess Umberto had one too, or somebody had one. There's the guys, right? Right there, and that's for Max. So they just started playing Max as a whole bunch. Um, they were they got booked by Peter Crowley, who was the music director at Max's Kansas City. I did an interview with him that you will see in Mamuve. Um, and then over here, so here is the okay. Now I'm question question Umberto, where did you get this photo? What, you don't have the test pressing. The, the test pressing belongs to some guy in Italy, I believe. Correct? Or did you buy this? Was this sold off separately from? The rest of the Grimm collection, because I believe this is this is um, this is is this Jonathan Grimm's copy or is this a different copy? Um, one of these wound up in the Max's Kansas City jukeboxes. Um, that is yours. You own a you own a test pressing. Wait, so Umberto, have you ever tried to digitize the the mixes on that? I need. Oh my god, dude, that's Glenn's copy. What? That was Glenn's copy. Wait, Umberto, have you were you able to play it back? Yeah, it is like porn. I agree, Rue. Uh, were you ever able to play this back, dude? You have to digitize this while you can. Holy fuck. Um, so this is from the, so we talked about in our previous episode, like how valuable um these test pressings are, these acetates, whatever the fuck you want to call them. Because they contain mixes that you may not um, that 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 may be different from what the final output was. I hope I hope that if you if it is playable that you try and digitize it, Umberto. I would love to hear that shit someday. The Misfits at the Fourth Street uh, Saloon. This is in Pennsylvania, right? Um, look, there's the Fast. That was another band. Yeah, this is in Bethel Bethlehem, and the Victims played there too. Uh, so they did two sets. You would go there and you would do two sets. Uh, at uh, 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 So that this is actually four shows if you want to, because they would do two sets a day. So the Misfits did two sets on April 13th, two sets on the 14th. And they also would um, uh, record the shows. That Some of the shows were recorded um, and a bootleg called Live the Perfect Crime uh, was distilled. It's basically a live version of horror business. I believe um, was was taped at uh, one of those one of those dates. Um, this is from Refused again. I'm gonna have to talk to that Refused guy. Uh, okay, this is cool. A band bio, cir circa seventy eight to seventy nine. I don't think I've ever seen this before. Look at this copyright. Yeah, here you go. Static Age Music, Words and Music by Glenn Tianger Samaras. We want, we want, we need, we take. 
All right, I'm going to read this. This I'm going to read because I just need to. A misfit, according to lead singer Glenn Danzig, is someone who's misplaced and doesn't fit in, an outsider. The misfits are comprised of four talented and misplaced individuals. Bassist Jerry Only, guitarist Bobby Steele, drummer Joey Pills, and Danzig. All four are the products of growing up in the industrial wastelands of Northeast New Jersey, a.k.a. Bergen County. Wow. Okay, so Umberto says this is super rare. This is blowing my mind, though. Glenn Danzig almost died when he was born at Hackensack Hospital and says the world will regret that they let me live. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's really hilarious. Um, if it's like just like a goof. Uh, as a kid, he sang with his brother's records. He grew up depraved in a nearby Lodi, in nearby Lodi and was allowed to graduate from Bergen County Tech. He possesses a, a visible nasty streak, both on and off stage, true to his cancerous birth, cancerous birth sign, and claims he he's the only one in the family who can't hold a steady, respectable job. Um, how do you get to be such a total outcast? Somebody wants you to be one way, he explains, and you are another way. So where do where does where do the ends meet? You know, this is very interesting because. It really says something about Glenn's personality at that time. Wow. Interesting. Jerry Only is one of only two remaining original band members. Born in Passaic under strange circumstances, he eventually moved to Lodi, where he met Glenn and successfully got out of high school. He describes his family as bigger than a bread box and twice as empty. Ouch. He has two brothers, PC Doyle. Okay, so this was Doyle. So before Doyle was just Doyle or Doyle Wolfgang von Frankenstein, he was known, and, and Rocky told me about this, he was known as PC Doyle. PC standing for Paul Kayafa, which is which is Doyle's real name is Paul. So he was PC Doyle, uh, a guitar player, and Schlock, who does absolutely nothing. Schlock is Rocky, who would go on and, and tour tour with the original band all over. He did a lot of the driving uh, for the band and helped with layout and design and distribution, all sorts of jazz. Like when I mean distribution, I mean giving out records at his school. Those black rings around Jerry's eyes aren't painted on. They are a result of a rare pigment defect at birth, which has left his face permanently discolored in that area. His favorite saying is, I like to feel it squirm until it dies. Um, I wonder where, I wonder where um, Jerry, I guess Jerry got the idea to do that makeup from being a football player. That's just Jerry putting on his football makeup. Instead of going to play a game, he's going to play a show. So it's fucking cool as fuck. <gasps> That's wait, there's more to this Umberto. It's two pages and you only have one page. You're killing me, dude. Oh no. I want to see the other page. Here we go. An iconic poster, truly iconic. It started as a twisted dream and ended with the world in heat. This is what I was using for a teaser trailer for They Came From Lodi. I kind of like They Came From the Static Age, though. That's pretty interesting, too. So this is in taken in Jerry's pool house, right, on the little stage that Jerry built for the band. And um, they would just, they would practice in there and they would take, you know, do photo shots. This was for a photo shoot. Misfits on tour. I don't know if they were actually on tour. Bullet, the single out now. I always love that. Bullet, the single out now. Here's Howie Pyro, who's also in my documentary as well. I'm just going to keep saying that, Umberto. Uh, the guys that I got that you got, I'm going to note notate that. Um, uh, think think of it as a uh, uh, friendly friendly rivalry. Uh, said with much love. Uh, so that's Howie. He was in a band called The Blessed, uh, who played with the Misfits a ton. And he's also in D-Generation. He was also... In Danzig, um, uh, as, as as Glenn's bassist in Danzig. So here we go. Um, hmm, why is that crossed out? Interesting. Oh, there you go. Because you got the Misfits. The Misfits played with the nuns, right? They're just highlighting it to make it easier to see. Very cool. Very cool. Here's the Friday and Saturday. Huh. Oh yeah, there you go. The Blessed and the Misfits. See, so, yeah, they did a bunch of shows together. This book, this book is put out, is put together so well. The layout is phenomenal. This really is a fucking excellent book. And you want to know something? I'm sure whatever the Misfits might put out will be fucking cool. 
Uh, maybe we'll see some unseen photos because those guys are the source. But this book is done so well. And frankly, they I wish that the Misfits would hire Tom, Jeremy, and Umberto to like put together their book too. That's what they should have done. They should have had these guys put together their book because it's just it's just so fucking good. R.I.P. Howie. What? Alberto, Howie's not dead. What are you talking about? <laughs> R.I.P. Howie. Howie's alive, dude. <laughs> Howie's alive. He's got a DJ gig soon. Here's here's the show that put the Misfits on the map. I talk about this in 1979. The Damned and the Misfits, man. Put that. This put them on the fucking map. Boom. Right? Um, this was the show that I think elevated the Misfits to new heights. And this is the show, you know, t uh, Tony, who I interviewed, Tony Matura, he's one of the uh, mods in, in the Facebook group. By the way, if you don't belong to the Facebook group, join it because that's where we show exclusive shit that we don't post um, publicly yet. Um, so if you want to see it early, join the Facebook group. Uh, Tony was uh, agrees with me. He said um, that he believes that this was when uh, the Misfits, this is what helped the Misfits get their headlining show at Irving Plaza. Um, that, that iconic 1979 Halloween show with the Mad Monster Movie Club. So that was, uh, so here's another poster from Max's Kansas City Wednesday, August 9th. So they played Max's a whole bunch. Um, the Static Age Band played there a whole bunch. And they would continue to play until they got kicked out because of Bobby threw a glass at some chick or some guy and, and they got hurt. There's one. I don't think I've seen that one before. Wow, look at that. Friday, May 12th at uh, 57 Club. There's the there's the show's place, right? June 29th. Very cool. And this these are the Max's Kansas City. These sort of like these slots, right? And just go down. Wait, what? What do you mean how he passed? Are you you've got to be fucking kidding me? Wait, 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 wait. Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up right now. Wait, Howie Pyro died? Excuse wait, what? Howie Pyro's dead? You've gotta be fucking kidding me. He didn't die two years ago. Howie's alive. You guys are you guys sure you what are you, what are you guys talking about? Two years ago. Howie <laughs> Dude, I, I, I was just chatting with Howie on Instagram. He's still alive. <laughs> oh, you had me scared there for a minute. I was like, what? I feel like I would have seen if Howie had died. Howie is alive, you guys. He's alive and well. He's alive and well. No worries. Okay, here we are. Page 34, Rue. Here it is. Joey Pill. Damn, that's got to be fucking rare as fuck. Look at that. So they are autographing. That's an early Glenn Danzig. You see a lot of bootleg Danzig signatures that look like that, but... um. Uh, now Glenn scribbles it all together, condenses it. He had me freaked out about that Howie Pyro. How, how do you think Howie Pyro died? He didn't die. Um, guys, are you talking about Howie Pyro is not dead? He's alive. What are you talking about? Is this like Large Marge from Pee Wee Herman? Tell him Large Marge sent you. I know Howie Pyro is not dead. He's alive. I saw him in New York City Last year at a King Kong and the Barbecue show, I was like chatting. I was hanging out with him. I, ch I was chatting with him. <laughs> Thank you, Umberto. <laughs> like, what the fuck? He probably, was he probably was not dead. That was so silly. Okay, look at this. So this is the first time, I guess this is the first actual time that the uh, Crimson Ghost is used. Wednesday, Mar for Wednesday March 28th for their uh, Max's Kansas City show, right? Printed directly from Jerry Only's film copy of the poster. Wow. This, po this poster displays artwork with the original raw edges and obscure typography before it was edited and cropped. Wow. Well, I'm just going to clean this lens here. Wow. That is so fucking cool. Silk screen poster for their March 28th show. This marks the first ever use of the Crimson Ghost. Yes, I knew that. I, I knew that. Um, yeah, no, Howie Pyro is totally fucking alive. You could find him on Instagram. He's constantly on social media. That's why I was like, kind of like, I was like, what, how can he be dead? He's always around. He's always talking about stuff. Um, yeah, really great. Really, really great. All right, we'll go back and read the blurbs. 
All right, we've come to horror business. So here's what we're going to do here. All right. I am going to split up this episode into two parts, right? We're going to keep going. I'll keep uh, doing my little commentary as we're looking at the, the thing. But um, I'm just very grateful that we uh, made it this far without the uh, show breaking off. So I'm going to collect all of these live snippets. I'm going to put them together as one episode, right? And um, we're going to do a part two because I... I, I have to go, actually. Um, my brother just got home from work. I have not seen him. Uh, and this is taking way longer than I thought it was uh, in terms of looking through the book. And I don't want to rush it. I'd rather do it right. I don't want to keep pushing for it. So we will we will reconvene with horror business. And we will continue to look through this beautiful book. Like I said, pick this book up at um, Barnes & Noble or Amazon or... Um, there's some brick and mortar stores. Um, you can support the creation of this content. Uh, the information is in, in, uh, the description. Uh, thank you so much. Maybe what we'll do is we will, here's what we're going to do tomorrow. We're going to broadcast again. We're going to go through the book again. Um, Rue says, damn, I'm happy to be wrong. Howie's a nice guy. I've had a few drinks with him back in the day. Yeah, dude. Dude, you were making me like seriously freak. Oh, the mix up is with Todd Youth. Thank you, Alberto. Yes, Todd Youth died. Todd Youth played in both Degeneration and um, fucking uh, Danzig with Howie. Todd Youth died, sad, tragically, of a uh, drug overdose, I believe, uh, last year. Uh, no, not last year, two years ago, uh, before. Yeah, 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 that's right. Before Jason, Jason, then Jason Trioxin died. Um, it was just like one after another. So crazy. Um, but we're going to pick this up. Okay, Umberto, we're going to pick this up. We're going to do this again tomorrow, guys. Same time, 7, 7 p.m. EST. We're going to continue. This episode is going to drop tonight if I can get my brother's computer to, 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 to edit what I need to edit. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to. And uh, like I said, um, look in the blurb uh, where you can uh, support the creation of this content. More to come. Thank you so much for those of you to have your patient for having patience with me in this terrible uh, uh, place with bad Wi-Fi and doing this from a phone. It's just very problematic. Okay, peace and hair grease. We will we will pick this up.